Adesawa in Kandakra. This is Media Live on TV3. We're also live on DSTV Channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa. Sorry, top of the bulletin this afternoon. CEO of Mansgold granted bail to the tune of 1 billion cities with five sureties. Also, Ghana Health Service begins nationwide vaccination against tropical diseases. On the international front, North Korea calls eight tests of two new missiles on Thursday a solemn warning against what is described as South Korean war mongers. Many thanks for joining us. Let's go to our first story now. Illegal miners driven away from parts of the eastern region have relocated to the Co West municipality, destroying large portions of farmlands and the Pra River. The Co West Municipal Security Council has named a local company, Medinka, as a company doing the illegal mining. It reports by Komla Kluche. We set off en route to Kotumpa, a farming community in the Kuo West municipality. In less than two kilometers, the level of destruction was telling. The topswell removed deep pits dug and local machines for sieving the soil left by the miners, a tributary of the Pra River that passes through the community, diverted and used by the miners who are currently on the run. The issue of illegal mining in Kuo West was non-existent until two months ago. Information reached the paramountcy of the Kuo Traditional Council, who followed up by the miners bolted upon a tip-off. The chiefs, however, are bent on cracking the whip on these miners they have identified allegedly as having foreign nationality but aided by locals. The Jasi Hini of Obokwe, Nana Dr. Okra Bedu III, alleged that when the action was first reported to the police, they failed to act. The MC said that uh, we should give him time so that he will get himself together and organize it very well, bring Vanguard to accompany uh, the Nananum to come to the site. So the MC said we should give him time. And that time is running out. Two weeks ago, one of the excavators was actively uh, found in town and uh, had been deemed prepared to enter into the field. This particular one, whose battery you can see around here, has been removed, was actively working on the grounds here the chiefs have alleged the Kwe West Municipal Security Council has admitted there exists illegal mining. The Municipal Security Council is on a manhunt for the miners who they have identified under a licensed mining company. One of the companies I've mentioned is called Medinka. Through through the registered company, maybe the procedure for the extraction of the mineral from the land is what may be wrong. But as to whether they have the concessions, all those lands have concessionaires, so they are properly um, acquired areas where they are doing their mining, except that they may be following the wrong procedure. So now we've stopped them, they cannot go ahead. Few meters from the concessions, the Operation Vanguard team arrives and plans with the chiefs on how to crack the web. They will, however, not speak to the news team. Few meters from Kuntumpa is the community of Aprashim. This is another place this miners have been able to do this level of destruction. The fight against Galamse has a long way to go if as a people we do not rethink our decision to destroy the environment. Komla Kluche, TV3 News, Ku West. Now, away from Kuo, an aspiring national chairperson for the Convention People's Party, CPP, Araba Bintiencho, has charged party members to work towards victory in 2020, addressing some supporters at Cape Coast to declare her intentions to contest for the position of chairperson. She noted the party needs new leadership to reorganize the party's grassroots. 
70-year-old Araba Bentiencho started her political journey as a young pioneer during the late Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's regime and was an appointee in Dr. Hila Liman's government. I have been trained how to do it, so I will bring to bear. We will go from house to house, constituencies will go to schools. We will make sure that we bring, first of all, the moment I'm pronounced chairman, I will call every CPP member that has been aggrieved and therefore have quit the party. If you are in another party, we will call you. If you come, we will deal nicely with you and we will receive you beautifully. Now, an Accra circuit court has granted the chief executive officer of men's gold, Nana Pia Mensa, aka Namwan Bail, in the sum of one billion cities with five sureties. The court presided over by Jane Harriet Akwelekwe ordered that three of the sureties must be justified. Namwan is also required to report to the police every Wednesday. Prosecutors have charged Namwan, his wife, and sister and his two companies, Men's Gold and Brew Marketing Consult, with 13 counts of abetment to defraud by false pretense, defrauding by false pretense, engaging in money deposit business without license, dealing in gold without license, and money laundering. Namwan was granted bail after his lawyer, Kwame Kufu, moved a bail application. Counsel argued that his client was not a flight risk and would always avail himself to stand trial. Hundreds of customers of men's gold and sympathizers also thronged the court's premises. For God be so good to us, now he has been granted bail. The next action is that you should come out with payment plan and pay us. Period. It is very clear. There are stories. There are things that are going on. So we want government to just understand that this must be handled by the judiciary alone. So that issues of data bank, blah, blah, and all those things, we don't, we don't want them to interfere in this. Men's God customers, we are dying. Men's God customers, and we are with them watching Kodana, Bebria Wu, a man for your stroke, or be a word to the papa, and then the mommy. Say, 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 so let's stay a while longer in this and speak with Salom Amenya, my colleague who was in court this morning. Salom, thank you for joining us. Tell us what happened in court this time. Well, so um, today when they came to court, the charges as presented by the prosecution was read to the accused person, that is Nana Pia Mensa, and then he pleaded not guilty to all the charges all leveled 13. against him. And uh, his lawyer, Kwame Kufu, like we had, actually moved the application for his bail. And while moving the application, he made certain key arguments. His argument was that one, uh, the notion, or as it's been circulated by na that number one jumped bail, is mm. false. Okay. Because before he left the country, he asked permission from the necessary authorities that he needed to go transact some business in Dubai. In Dubai. And when you look at the, the warrant for his arrest, it's been nine months. And his lawyer, Kwame Kufu, is saying that all the nine months, he has been in custody in Dubai. Mm. So he didn't jump bail. Number two, he's saying that the police had nine months to conduct whatever investigations they had. They had to. So it is not this time that they will say that they want to keep him in custody to conduct further investigations. Mm. All the nine months, what were they doing? So these are some of the arguments. He also said that the notion that he was extradited to Ghana or he was brought in is false. He came on his own volition. So these are some of the critical arguments he made. And the judge decided that, uh, it was, that there was the need for him to be granted bail. And he was granted bail in that sum, the one billion cities. He also said that the one billion, he felt it was on the high side because at the moment his assets have been confiscated yeah. by the state. But the judge felt the one billion cities was okay. It was okay. So last week, we knew that the case was... The proceedings have been very early and the mm -hmm. customers were unable to, to get to see what happened. Yeah. Was it the same thing this week? What happened? Yes, th this week customers got to the place very early. Earlier. Very early. 
and uh, rather uh, it was Namwan that did not come early and you saw when he came in how they were chanting and the rest but the push of the customers was one that uh, sought to say that they're not really bothered about the court case and all okay. of that all they want is the man to be granted bill mm -hmm. and once he's granted bill they want to sit with him and find out what is the terms of payment how are they going to get their money back mm -hmm. and it was very peaceful so we, we, we had them chanting what, what were they saying yes they're saying that give us back our money and that uh, some were also saying that he was a hero now one is a hero and then they adore him so we are going back on the 12th of august for the case to continue. For the case. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Salam Amenya is my colleague who monitored the proceedings on the hearing of the Namwan case. You're still watching Midday Live on TV3, also live on DSTV channel 279. Let's stay a while longer on this. And Srem Sai is a constitutional lawyer and has joined us. Or we're working Skype to make sure that we get to speak with him. When we do, we'll also take his bid on the call by the customers for Nam One to be released so that there can be a discussion on how the payment is going to go. So let us know how you feel about this story. Send us your views and comments on our various social media platforms, and they will be read live on this platform. Our colleague Martin Esiridata is also at the police headquarters, and he's joining us for the latest on the proceedings. So we'll come back to this issue. We'll go back to Martin and also speak with the lawyers on the various angles of this story. But let's go to Parliament because Parliament has corrected errors in the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill 2019, which was passed into law on Monday. The bill was, today, was withdrawn to enable the House to make the necessary corrections to make way for the President to assent to. The bill is expected to, among other things, curtail political thuggery and help bring sanity in the country's political front. The bill was laid amid disagreements from the minority in Parliament and the National Democratic Congress that argued that a bipartisan engagement which had then been initiated was the way to go. That notwithstanding, the bill was passed on Monday. However, during proceedings on Thursday, the majority leader, who is also the leader of the House, Oseche Mentabonso, moved the motion for the House to rescind its decision in respect of the third reading of the bill. A couple of issues that got mixed up, even though we, we handled those appears, it got lost in um, the recording of proceedings. And that means that the wrong thing was captured. So we need to write that in order to have the, um, the bill in a much more appropriate form. After the corrections were made, the Minister for Planning, Professor George Jan Bafo, read the bill for the third time, after which the House passed the amended bill into an act. Now, the minority in Parliament has accused government of illegally awarding a contract worth $10 million to a member of the Council of State to audit Coco Roads. The NDC MPs allege the Kofuado government wasted the taxpayers' money to illegally engage auditors who have not been sanctioned by the Auditor General to audit Coco Roads started under the previous administration. Responding to recent claims by President Ekufuado that the previous Mahama-led NDC administration mismanaged the cocoa sector, Minority Spokesperson on Food and Agriculture Eric Opoku said the Mahama administration embarked on projects such as free fertilizer for cocoa farmers and free distribution of cocoa hybrid seedlings. According to him, the president was misled by his advisers over his claims that the Mahama administration did not embark on any project under the cocoa sector. The Mahama administration projected and collateralized 638,710 metric tons of cocoa for the 1.8 billion syndicated loan it contracted for the 2016-2017 cocoa season, but achieved a production volume of 969,000 metric tons of cocoa. The remaining 330,000 290 metric tons of cocoa 
was inherited by the Kufuado government. The minority also cautioned the CEO of Cocoa Board, Joseph Wahin Edu, that a future NDC government would hold him responsible of any financial loss in the area of Cocoa Roads. Needless to say that the government of Ghana has already incurred so much financial loss upon itself through this reckless handling of Cocoa Roads project. We therefore wish to sound this note of caution to the current CEO of Cocoa Board that we shall hold him responsible for any financial loss in the area of Cocoa Roads in the future. So TV3 can confirm that the CEO of Namwana, Napia Mensa, has met all the bill conditions at the police headquarters. My colleague Martin Isidu Date is there and joining us with more on the phone. Hello, Martin. Tell us a lot more about this development. Yes, um, I'm reporting live from the police PID headquarters here in Accra and can confirm that Napia Mensa, uh, popularly known as Namwana, has just left the premises of the police headquarters and is headed out with some police officers to go and check for some of the sureties that he's supposed to have met. Because what has been ongoing since 10.30 that we got here was purely paperwork. So they've been inside the offices of the CID headquarters working out to ensure that everything in terms of paperwork is done to the very letter. And just when he completed that, about uh, two minutes ago, he came up from the premises of the CID headquarters and was smiling, waving at some of his supporters who had gathered here right from the time he arrived and sat in his car, had uh, one police officer sit in the car as well with him and then another police vehicle follow his car and they are going to check and be sure that all the conditions that he is supposed to meet are met before he can be said to be a free man. But uh, since I arrived here, I've seen some of the supporters here. They are in very, very, um, you know, positive mood, saying that there is a surety that the man, a.k.a. number one, would be given the freedom to go ahead and pay off those that uh, have locked up investment in men's gold. And there's also the positive vibe coming off the supporters here, that they know he does, he has done no wrong, and that is why the courts have granted him bail. And so we will stay here for some time and see what happens. We are actually following. We have people who are following them, want to see what the next line of action would be. When we do get the, that information, we'll put it out. Let me quickly add, however, that there seems to be some cordiality in the processes leading up to he leaving the, op the offices of the CID. Mm. Because when he came out, he looked cheerful. He was waving at some of the supporters who were here. They are not customers of Men's Gold. They are supporters of Nam One and the business. Some of them have t-shirts with uh, inscriptions concerned use of Ghana written on the front, clearly showing solidarity and support for Nam One. And it looks as if he himself is in good chair and uh, we'll see whatever uh, comes up again. We'll let our viewers know about it. Absolutely, Martin. Thank you very much for that update. We'll definitely come back to you in our subsequent bulletins for a lot more. This is Midday Live on TV3. Let's do some more stories. The Minister of State in charge of tertiary is admonishing the former Vice Chancellor of University of Education, Winneba, Professor Maoto Avoke, to petition the incoming Governing Council for his reinstatement. Professor Kwisi Yanka was concerned about the constant visits by the former VC, which he says could trigger industrial unrest among lecturers. The Minister of Education has already lashed out at the former Vice-Chancellor for storming the Winba campus to create mayhem. Dr. Matthew Pokuprempe criticised and implored the disgruntled professor to seek legal redress instead of forcefully seeking to reinstate himself. Barely 48 hours after his pronouncement, the Minister of State in charge of tertiary, Professor Kwesianka, asked Professor Mauto Avoke to desist from visiting the campus. Professor Kwesianka expressed fear the attitude of the aggrieved former Vice Chancellor could affect smooth academic work. He entreated him to petition the incoming governing council of the university. Let's wait for a few days for the governing council to be instituted. 
and they will take fuller control of this. Um, maybe if there are any petitions that he's presenting, the council, I'm sure, will look at it. If you want to resort to the court of law, of course, um, if a court so rules, I'm sure the, the ministry or the university or the council of the university will similarly comply with any such other. But we should avoid situations that will lead to confrontations if um, supporters of the other or the vice chancellor also decide to retaliate. Um, there will certainly be chaos on campus, so I will urge them to, you know, hold their horses and if anything at all, rely on the laid down principles and procedures for getting grievances addressed. Meanwhile, the professor Chrissy Yanka has sworn in 13 governing councils for colleges of education. He charged them to assist in improving sound academic environments. Media Life is back with more stories after this break. Don't go away. Let's do business now and the Ghana Union of Traders Association has given government 90 days to resolve the retail impasse or face their wrath in a planned mammoth demonstration dubbed Destiny Day demonstration. The president of Guta, Dr. Joseph Obing, says that disregard for existing laws is heartbreaking, adding members are bent on taking the laws into their hands if government looks on without any action. He spoke on Captured by Women and all women Women Current Affairs show to be aired this Saturday on TV3. We are going to call um, the Destiny Day demonstration within three months if the government From hasn't now. done anything. Yeah, the okay. Destiny Day de demonstration means that mm -hmm. if one law, the law that protects the common trader, that uh, is being uh, forced to pay all taxes and all that, the other taxes, the laws in taxes works for us. But the, the law that protests us is not, not working. working for you. It means that it's going to nullify. This law is going to nullify all other laws. We are not going to pay taxes. We are going That's to pile up. Daring. We are going to pile up the VAT invoices and burn them. The Destiny Day demonstration means that they're going to be total chaos. We are going to close the shops forcefully. And this is going to solve the problem. And within three months, we are going to see that. Thank you. The Barbados Ghana Business Chamber has been launched to promote commerce between the two countries. The Business Chamber seeks to facilitate trade, agriculture, tourism, education and training for both countries. The Barbados Ghana Business Chamber, BGBC, seeks to facilitate effective business as well as promote knowledge sharing between the two countries. The human capital, yes, there's a huge opportunity there as well. They've indicated something around health, there's something around education. Based on this relationship, there are investors who will also possibly ex explore investing in, let's say, the banking sector in Ghana. Immediately, some of these things happen. They open the market and they open access. The Chamber is working with some institutions, including the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Ghana Tourism Authority, and the Association of Ghana Industries to achieve a set objectives. Director of Marketing and Operations of GEPA, Agnes Giftie Japong Sam hinted some initiatives their department has taken to promote trade. There will be about an 80 member delegation being organized by the Ghana Expo Promotion Authority to go and explore the market in Barbados because it is good to also be there to see what they have and to come back and to put our product in the way that meets their needs. The people of Barbados will now consume Ghanaian products and vice versa. And now Chief Economist for Africa Region at the World Bank, Albert Sufak, says the biggest risk to Africa's macro outlook is rising debt. He argues many countries in Africa have a debt to GDP ratio above 100% with unsustainable debt composition crowding out relevant sectorial spending. He was speaking at the world's first Equathon held in Accra. The World Bank estimates almost 40% of sub-Saharan African countries are in danger of slipping into major debt crisis. 
Eight countries are already in debt distress, while a further 18 countries are at risk of joining them. Ghana in 2018 was named among 18 countries with high risk of debt distress. Unsustainable debt presents significant risks to global commitments to end extreme poverty, a situation which threatens the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 1. At the world's first ever econothon, Chief Economist for Africa Region at the World Bank, Albert Zufak, observed, Rising debt is a major threat to the macroeconomic outlook of most African countries. The debt situation is actually quite uh, preoccupying and some would say alarming. It has become more market-led. Most, you know, number of African countries are now issuing euro bonds to finance, you know, uh, their needs. Most African countries are actually not borrowing for investment, but for consumption. You would agree with me that it's not going to pay for itself. He stressed after HIPIC, debt has climbed to high levels. More distressing is the changing composition of present African debt, which he says has become more private and non-concessional, raising major issues of sustainability. This is probably one of the issues that keep me up at night. There's one country in Africa that spends 90% of its fiscal revenue in just debt service and salaries. So there is almost nothing left to finance education, to finance you know, uh, health, to build the human capital and the productive assets that should power growth moving forward. He stressed the need for sound economic policies and steadfast leaders to change the structure of African economies. That's all for business. Time now for a breather. We're back soon. It can be very frustrating when you want to use the restroom so badly. See it all nasty. You try to avoid bacteria by cleaning, spraying a sanitizer, lining the toilet seat, and squatting. The Sunny Automatic Toilet Seat has the ultimate solution. With a simple wave of the hand across the sensor, the toilet seat provides you with a fresh, clean, hygienic seat for each individual use. It comes with a rechargeable battery that lasts for a month. The charging duration is 6 hours. The film roll is not reusable. Toilet seat is ideal for private or commercially shared toilets, hotels, office buildings, hospitals, and schools. For purchases, please contact. 026-98-00-000 or 050-005-7333. We can be located at Sakumono Traffic Light. If it must be your toilet seat, it must be the sunny. Hey, customer. I send the woman your fit in day now. Na then a mom stretch marks in the pimples knee in our boy. She, I'm red Danny. I will suit Danny be. Now the new life cream will come higher na. I know a cream bag. Bra 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 bra. Now who will come ha? Yeah, na me walk. New life cream and no name secrets. New life cream. Any new life cream, a gem and crochet and a stretch mask. Now, we will be able to cosmetic shops and a herbal shops. Customer, mommy, you can't go to new life in the answer. Oh, customer, it's our bag. New life cream. One man is my year of Bessima. This advertisement has been written and approved by the FDA. Banga Wego! Her deepest fear is that women are powerful beyond measure. Are you a Muslim? Yes, please. And how does your family feel about you taking part in this kind of pageant? The thrills, excitement and boldness starts with the little steps you take as a young lady. Watch the progressive steps of Ghana's most beautiful 2019 auditions. Dabbed, black and proud. Who qualifies to represent the 16 regions of Ghana? I don't know if it's a drama or comedy, and then I can rap small. Okay. 
Give me your best shot. Ghana's most beautiful, redefining beauty to promote national unity. GNB 2019 is brought to you by Mada Powdered Soap, Roma Insecticide Spray and Coil, Fecal Spray Starch, Sasso Insecticide Spray and Coil, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, and Coco Dairy Free Coconut Milk. Kaswa, are you ready? The strongest train will hit Kaswa at the Odupong Pehe School Park on July 27th. It's your turn to witness Ghana's strongest 2019. Who is your favorite contestant? Meet us there. Remember, the time is 1 p.m. sharp. Don't miss out. Ghana's strongest. The power to do. Ghana's strongest is brought to you by Gassem, the nation builder. Mixi Choco, Chane Hot. Day by Day Man from Dream Cosmetics. Ernest Ointment. Agbevemona Cream and Agbevemona Soap. Frutelli. Mini Plus Hippo Chairs. And Holy Trinity Spa and Health Farm. <laughs> Warm up shows every Saturday at 10 a.m. Make a date on TV3. Welcome back. This is Midday Live on TV3. Now, Ghanaian voters are twice as much likely to vote for parliamentary candidates who provide infrastructural development than those who promise financial support to individuals. According to research by the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, this is in contrast to propagated opinion that MPs are voted to be lawmakers. The research comes around a time political parties are preparing for their primaries. The CDD said it conducted the research between November to December 2018. It established that constituents want to meet their representatives regularly to listen to their concerns and be debriefed on parliamentary debates. A key finding was that voters preferred candidates who pledged to spend the MP's common fund on infrastructural development as compared to one who plans a reverse. The reason why I conducted this research is to make sure that we begin a conversation about uh, what exactly citizens want from members of parliament. And then that generates the second order question as to whether the members of parliament are doing the job that citizens want. It's important that we understand on what basis people make choices of who their MPs should be to be able to evaluate them on, on those dimensions. The study uses a focused choice conjoint survey experiment with a sample of a 2,000 with a sample of over 2,000 citizens located in 12 nationally representative constituencies. The respondents were asked to choose between two hypothetical candidates contesting for parliamentary elections in their constituencies with a set of attributes. Now let's go to the health sector where the Ghana Health Service through its neglected tropical disease program will be embarking on a nationwide mass drug administration to eliminate elephantiasis and onchocerciasis. It will be done in about 125 districts across the country that are endemic to these diseases. The distribution will be done by well-trained community volunteers or community drug distributors who will be moving from house to house to administer the onchocerciasis and elephantiasis drugs. So Dr. Benjamin Marfo is Programs Manager of the Neglected Tropical Diseases Department of the Ghana Health Services and has joined us in the studio. Thank you, Doc, for coming through. Most so, Doc, welcome. why has this exercise become necessary? Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, we do annual mass drug administration okay. in, in the country. And uh, so last year we're here, uh, I even came to your studio and we, we talked about it and we did mass drug administration 
all over the all over the country. And this year we are continuing. What we are we are trying to do is that we want to eliminate lymphatic filariasis, otherwise known as elephantiasis, mm. and oncocercasis, that is river blindness okay. from the country. So that that's the essence of the Mass Drug Administration. And we'll be moving to um, um, nine of the ten, let's say, regions, the traditional ones. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can talk about 15, 16, out, of the, yeah. 15 out of the 16. So mm -hmm. we will not be in Greater Accra, okay. but we'll be in, in, in the other, the uh, other the regions. regions. So you've been doing it over the o years over the now. Years. What is the current situation? Have you seen any reduction instead of doing it? What is the current trend yes, now? So if, if, if you talk about elephantiasis, we started with, uh, with uh, 98 endemic districts in the country. As I speak now, we've, uh, we have trans... Um, uh, we have broken transmission in eight, 83 mm. out of the 98, and we are left with 15 more. For river blindness, we had to do another survey that showed that, showed that other uh, districts were also endemic, aside the traditional ones that we, we knew mm -hmm. of. Yeah, and that, so for river blindness, we had to increase the number of districts endemic for river, uh, mm -hmm. river blindness. So instead of the 85 uh, traditional ones that we, we knew, we're now, we're now doing for 120 districts for mm. river blindness. But for um, elephantiasis, uh, it has been scaled down. Okay, so river, river, the, the development in the river blindness areas, how alarming is this? Yes, so we, st um, we, 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 we now do not have uh, real examples of people getting blind from the, from the disease. Unlike in the past, uh, but it, it, it's still it's so prevalent. Uh, yeah, it's still prevalent. Mm. So, in terms of blindness, yes, it is. Uh, it has remarkably, uh, remarkably, it, it has reduced. But then, uh, the prevalence is still there. Mm. It's still there. Mm. Yes. So, the, these give us a bit of a breakdown of these areas that you have seen, so that people can get ready. Yes. For you. So, like I said, so as I said, uh, we'll be in uh, all the other regions except Greater Accra. So, I have the list here. So we talk about 125. District. 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 So when it comes to the half, we have about uh, 10 of them over there in the, in the districts in the half region. Ashanti also have quite a number over there, quite a number. And then uh, it comes to the other regions. But our uh, uh, officers, health officers, are, are aware of this in the regions and then the volunteers who are aware. Okay. So they'll be moving. We will be doing social mobilization and informing them the districts that will be coming to, and then we'll be administering the, the drugs. Um, my plea is that uh, we should all participate in this uh, very important exercise as we really want to eliminate uh, these diseases. We have done so for trachoma, and last mm. year we eliminated trachoma from Ghana, okay. uh, the first in sub Saharan Africa, and uh, we want to be in the lead when it comes to el elimination for, for elephantiasis. Okay. Yeah. Doc, how soon is the starting? Yes, we're starting uh, from this very Monday, 29th of July. July. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Most Dr. Welcome. Benjamin Marfo is Programs Manager of the Neglected Tropical Disease Unit of the Ghana Health Service. This is Midday Live on TV3, also live on DSTV Channel 279. We're back with more after this break. Don't go away. Hello, good afternoon. It's time for Sports News on Midday Live on TV3. My name is Yao Ofosulabi. Now, there have been varied reactions to the AFCON 2019 budget presented on the floor of parliament by the Minister of Youth and Sports, Honorable Isaac Asiyama. Now, that Ghana planned to spend $6.3 million is considered outrageous by former sports minister Nilante van der Poy. Ghanaians have never liked the idea that money is splashed on the black stars in the hope that the elusive Africa Cup of Nations will be snatched by overly paying the players who should be wearing the shirts with pride. Pride and passion, they say, have been swapped with the hunt for cash. Almost $1 million was paid to the players in winning bonuses for the duration of Ghana's stay in Egypt. Considering that Ghana played only four matches, winning one, the thinking is that the players were overpaid. The sports minister Isaac Isiama told Parliament that out of the $6.3 million budgeted for the AFCON, $1.7 million was spared, while four point five million was spent by the travelling contingent, including catering for the fans and some journalists who were sponsored for the tournament. However, former sports minister Nilanti Vanderpoy calls for a committee to be set up to look into the expenditures. I think we should have a committee to probe further the total budget and expenditure of the ministry and what they spent. Because I am worried because the minister um, 
came to say they spent this amount of money. Meanwhile, the minister was giving only 43 million in the budget. So where did he get the rest of the money from? He must tell Ghanaians. Who financed this? Who gave out this money? Where did they take it from? Is it the fact that some other ministry's money was taken to finance this? All these are questions, legitimate questions that we must ask and we will ask and we deserve, Ghanaians deserve answers. So if you take a commission to bring out those answers, fine. If you take the Auditor General, if you take any forensic audit, if you take any committee to bring out those answers, I think Ghanaians deserve it. Ghana exited the tournament in the round of 16 after a penalty shootout loss to Tunisia. When our newly signed Crystal Palace forward Jordan Ayew's permanent switch to Sellers Park comes at the backdrop of a good showing at the, uh, for the Black Stars at the AFCON 2019 in Egypt. Ayew says he wants to put the past behind him and switch focus on helping the national team qualify for the 2021 AFCON. Yeah, you said you got back this morning. Obviously, recently you've been away at AFCON. Unfortunately, you went out in the last 16, but for you personally, two really good goals. It was, a, it was a good tournament for me. It was a very good experience for, for me, for my teammates and continue working hard because the next AFCON is right the corner. So we'll give it a go and we'll see if we can win the cup. But the most our target was to win the cup. We couldn't win the cup this time. So it's all part of, of football and we'll just prepare for the next one. Is it nice for you to be playing with your brother again? Yeah, it's always, it's always a pleasure to play with, with, with my brother, especially for the national team, because it was our dream one day to, to play for the national team and just have to thank God for everything that's happening and continue working hard. How long is it until you'll be back training? I don't know what's the, what, what's the program, but I'll start tomorrow and we'll take it from there. When our Santiago Toko midfielder Kwame Bunsu has completed a transfer to Tunisian outfit Esperance Sportif du Tunis. Now, the 24 year old joins the three time African champions in a reported four year deal, replacing Ivorian Frank Combe, who has moved on to Qatari side Ariane Sporting Club. Bunsu joined Kotoko last year after serving an 11 month jail term in Sweden for sexual assaults. He helped the Porcupine Warriors win the special competition after playing an instrumental role in the club's run to the group stage of the CAF Confederations Cup. When our two Premier League footballers have been involved in a carjacking attempt by an armed gang in London streets. Now, the Arsenal players, Mesut Ozil and Sid Kolasinac, were targeted, the club confirmed, but they both escaped uninjured. Footage on social media appears to show Kolasinac chasing the robbers in Platts Lane near the Golders Green at around 4 p.m. GMT. Arsenal, in a statement, said, we have been in contact with both players and they are fine. Well, now to a coaching appointment now, and former Barcelona striker Patrick Clivert has rejoined La Liga club uh, as director of the academy. Now, Clivert, who's 43 years old, has signed a two-year contract at Barca's La Masia youth system after being fired as Cameroon assistant coach earlier this month. He scored 145 goals in 308 appearances over six seasons at the Camp Nou, winning one La Liga title. Final story, and straight to boxing, where British heavyweight Dylan White tested positive for a banned substance before his victory against Oscar Rivas on Saturday. If the result is confirmed, the 31-year-old White could face an eight-year ban because it would be the second time he has been found guilty of a charge. Uh, now, he served a two-year ban from 2012 to 2014 for unknowingly taking an illegal supplement. White survived a nine-round knockdown to beat Colombian Rivas on points at London's O2 Arena. He is the mandatory challenger to WBC World Heavyweight Champion Deontay Wilder. Well, that's all the sports news. International news is next. On the international front, this afternoon, North Korea has called the test of two new missiles on Thursday a solemn warning against what it described as South Korean 
war mongers. The short range missiles were fired into the Sea of Japan, also known as the East Sea from Wonsom on North Korea's east coast. Leader Kim Jong un said his country was forced to develop weapons to eliminate potential and direct threats. He said the test involved a new tactical guided weapon system. Mr. Kim's comments reported in state media come after the North criticized a decision by South Korea and the US to hold military drills next month. North Korea has long regarded the drills as preparation for an invasion, though the U.S. and South Korea have refused to cancel the annual military exercises, they have been scaled back significantly. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said one of the new missiles traveled about 690 kilometers. The U.S. also confirmed that the missiles were short range. Let's now do entertainment. Entertainment critic and film director Ola Michael is optimistic situating the film village in the Ashanti region will be viable economically than a nascent region. But how would building a film village help revamp the movie industry? A film village represents a hub of filmmaking, a city or town that is solely dedicated to the industry of filmmaking. A film village is strategically developed to house film studios, productions, training, distribution and marketing of films. Government in the 2019 budget hinted it secured a 200-acre land to construct an international film village in the eastern region. Its location has however become a bone of contention. Some industry folk believe it will be economically unwise to situate such a strategic investment in the eastern region. We have spoken to some consultants and all they need is, you know, some sort of security from government. You know, like financial security and all those stuff, you understand? So there are people who are ready to invest in this thing already. And most of them would only do that if they know it's going to be cited in Ashanti region because they know Ashanti region is the hub for film. Again, we have told you that the location is very important. Ashanti region has got all that we look for for the citing of a film village. Chebi, who shoots film in Chebi anyway? It is however imagined that the Creative Arts Council intends to build two different film villages in the Ashanti and Eastern regions. Film director and producer Ola Michael takes that with a pinch of salt. Studies, leave them alone. They are just saying things there to calm people. There has never been any feasibility studies in Kumasi. It was just a meeting. And after the meeting, we told them we have secured two separate lands for two different locations. One is at Kunsu and one is at Himan. Kunsu is about 250 acres of land and Himan is 150 acres. So there was not like feasibility. It was we who did our own thing, went out to look for our own land. He maintained the decision to construct the facility in the eastern region is born out of political expediency. If not for political expediency, why do you take it to Chebi? We gave you the idea that this thing can bring a lot of money. We give you examples with the Maltese example, with the Indian example. So why take it to Chebi? But what happens if government goes ahead with plans to build a facility at Bonso in the eastern region? They will be constructing a white elephant. Nobody's going to go there. Reggae dancehall musician Ras Kuku has been busy in the studio working on a 15-track album titled Kuntum Kununku, the strictly reggae album which features Stoneboy, Samini and other artists from Jamaica. Ras Kuku is optimistic the Kuntum Kununku album, which drops in September 2019, will win him many laurels. Uh? Hey. Kuntun Kununku, you know, uh, yeah, one of the kings from the eastern region. Wasaji for Kuntun Kununku, very brave, you know, fearless. And Kuntun Kununku, too, is one of the names of the most I you know we have a couple of songs on it, but then how did it all start for? Yeah, man, we were working on the album since January. We are working on 15 songs and we are almost done. Yeah, it's not easy. 
me bumpa ye. Must I jam me bonka ye? Unto unko na wuna ye de ye be a bay my You know, I don't sleep. I'm always here because of Untun Kunko. Yes, yeah, so we need to put some things in all the music so that when the reggae album comes out, people will know that yeah, it is Kuntun Kununku and it is the heaviest, truly. A couple of times I've heard that it is difficult getting some people to work with and all that. Did you encounter any of that? Uh, no, 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 no. For this album, yeah, I've given it to everybody and they are all working on it. Okay. Some have received, some I'll be receiving very soon. So. Everything nice, you know. You know, you know the power of Raskuku in this music industry. Yeah, the boys, the stars. So you need Raskuku next time. So when I need you, you need to work with me. Yeah. Why strictly reggae? Uh, because reggae is good music. Any time you hear reggae, it's about good music. It's about letting the people know who they are. It will tell the woman that you don't bleach, don't do this, don't wear eyelashes. If you wear it, fire burn you. If you do this, that so many got 15 songs, all the songs solid. So many expectations next year by this time, next year, September. Kuntun Kununku, O ten one. What do you see? Yeah, Kuntun Kununku, Kuntun Kununku will be the album of the year next year because all the songs on it are hot, nice, and you can't just skip one track. And then next year, by this time, Raskuku should be crowned there. Reggae artist of the year and then reggae song of the year. So, yeah, my dad, we are telling the people. I know the Raskuku fans are looking forward to the release of the Kuntum Kununku album. That's it for today's edition of Media Live on TV3, which was also live on DSTV channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Sari. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.